can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Tommy Mello. Tommy Mello, you can check him out at A1Garage.com. You could also check him out at HomeServiceExpert.com. They also have a podcast, also FreedomEvent.com. Uh, it's amazing to look at some of those people on there. Tommy uh, built $200 million business, $100 million business, $180 million business. So obviously, even if any home services, but even if you're any entrepreneur, I think it's a valuable place to be. Um, and Tommy, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. And Tommy has two books, uh, which I've both I've listened to both of them. At the end of one of them, he talks about some of his favorite books. So we'll hear maybe has some new ones there. But uh, on that theme, uh, past guests include uh, Michael Gerber, who wrote The E-Myth, uh, Gino Wickman was a great episode, wrote Traction. Um, Chris Voss, one of my favorite books, Never Split the Difference. Uh, Perry Marshall, 8020 Sales and Marketing. And Mike Michalowicz, he wrote Profit First, Clockwork, and many more. Uh, Tommy, what are some of your favorites? Oh, man, where do I start? Uh, Influence, Robert Shadini, uh, Napoleon Hill, uh, you know, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. Or no, Dale Carnegie is how to win friends and influence. Yeah. Well, Napoleon Hill is uh, think and grow rich. Uh, obviously, I I could go all day with books. Depending on, I like the Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. I like Alex Tremosi, hundred million offers, actually more than hundred million leads. Uh, but we could talk books. All were you time. always like that? Like growing up, were you consuming entrepreneur stories, founder stories, or was it later on? I went through a little bit of a probably a seven year hiatus, but I mean, I think when I was mowing lawns back when I was a teenager, I had the cassette tapes. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Just trying to learn. I had those too. (laughs) Yeah. And Tom Hopkins, the, the art of sales and all that. Uh, You know, my parents listened to a lot of stuff like that. Zig Ziglar. But then I went through this little hiatus and then I just jumped back in and I have never let go of that. I had all those cassette tapes too: the Zig Ziglar in the car, the Brian Tracy in the car, yep. the Tom Hopkins in the car. I love it. Um, so anyways, check those episodes out and more. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. Uh, at Rise 25, uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships, partnerships. Uh, we do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. Uh, and we do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. So Tommy, we call ourselves the magic elves that run in the background and make it look easy for the host so they can create amazing content, amazing relationships, and most importantly, run their company. <clears throat> you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And if you know anything about Tommy, he is all about giving. Uh, and we'll talk about even the shop tours that he does. Um, and I love profiling the people and companies I admire and share with the world what they're working on. And so if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com to learn more. And I'm super excited to introduce Tommy Mello. He's the owner and operator of A1 Garage Door Service. And it's a leading $220 million home service-based business uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And they have over 700 employees in 19 states. Uh, He's also the host of the Home Service Expert and the author of two books, um, Elevate, uh, which is a book where he shares his secret to attracting and retaining and developing A players. And the second one is Home Service Millionaire Book. Uh, And he didn't grow up, by the way, with the silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, He's going to talk about some of the humble beginnings, uh, but he was constantly hustling. Uh, working to flip cars, starting landscaping business. Um, and he grew up hearing his parents talk about bill issues that really motivated him to remove money from the equation. So, Tommy, I appreciate you joining me. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to start with humble beginnings because when people hear $220 million business, um, it almost feels not real. 
And so I love for you to talk about a time when you wanted to quit, because as you know, it's a, uh, an overnight success over 20 years. Yeah. Well, it's so funny how the people that are your biggest fans become your haters, the higher you get. And there's a little bit of animosity because you stuck to it and you grind it. And it's not always roses and uh, tulips or whatever the saying is. It's like, I think about a day that I had a bridge loan that, that, that this bank gave me uh, that was bridge loaning in the SBA to get into this building. We bought the next door building as well. And I'm proud to say they're both paid off, but they weren't. And I didn't have enough money to buy them. And it was my first big purchase of real estate other than a house. And um, I had four markets that were struggling. And I had a buddy come in from Florida and he he spread out every market we were in. And uh, there was not a lot of money in the bank. We were doing a ton of revenue. I wasn't keeping any of it. And he looks at the balance sheets. And he goes through and he starts highlighting and circling stuff. And he goes, you got to close these four markets today. Offer a relocation package. You close these four markets. You need to get a really nice coffee machine in this place. Get it more well lit up. And he told me a bunch of stuff. But he goes, close these four markets. And I'm like, dude, it's just the wrong leadership. I could work through it. He goes, you're bleeding so bad and you don't even understand. And if he didn't come in and tell me that, and this is one of many stories, by the way, because uh, there's a lot of other horrifying stories. Um, when, when one of my top technicians, a good buddy of mine, died mm-hmm. on 4th of July with, with three daughters. But, you know, I had to make that decision that day. The next day they were closed. And I just, I didn't sell any of the business. I didn't, I just closed. Uh, And all of a sudden we shot up to 18% to the bottom line. And I relocated half the guys that were able to, and I helped the other people get jobs. It was a tough decision. But if that guy didn't be so adamant and pigheaded and tell me the facts, the stuff that I didn't understand because I believed that I could turn those around just like every entrepreneur does, then I don't know where I'd be. And there's, you know, so many things through adversity. A lot of things have gone wrong, but I fell down. I fell forward and I got back up. And man, there's a lot of times I felt like I got to slow down the growth or, you know, there's days where I couldn't sleep. And, you know, I bought, I had a 2012 Nissan Titan with 270,000 miles, crazy salvage title. And I wouldn't buy a new truck till every technician and installer had a new truck. And I moved into the apartments where my technicians were training for four years. And so far, we've had six people that were close in the company died, no, nobody on the job. Um, but having to write checks from my home equity line to make payroll, those were some of the toughest days. And those were earlier. Uh, they weren't in the beginning, but they happened when we started to grow too fast. and I didn't hire the right people. And I didn't have a good financial quick check and I didn't understand the financials. But you asked for one story. I've got so many, but there's days that you're just like, you don't even want to go in because there's a nightmare. You know, a nightmare is waiting for you. And it's so hard to keep going. But sometimes you're three feet from goal. Sometimes you're right at the end zone. You don't even realize it. You're one higher away from, from breaking through it all. And what I would tell you, Not everybody's cut out to do business. And some people should be an entrepreneur. They could go put their work jacket up. They don't have the stress, the anxiety. But but I'll tell you this. You put me between a rock and a hard spot, I'm going to fight. And you're going to never watch anybody work as hard. I'd be more dedicated to get through that. And that's all I know how to do. You put me in a hard spot, I love it because I know exactly what to do. You use that, Tommy, in part of the interview process, too, where you'll basically give them a scenario and say, there's a mad customer on the, talk about that, uh, mad customer on the phone, this person's walking in, this is going on. And that's probably real world, real world situations that you had to deal with that you're like, okay, what would you do? Yeah, the, the, I, I like to do, I learned this by interviewing at the Cheesecake Factory as a busboy, is they said there's an angry customer that walked in that didn't get their takeout order. There's two people waiting to be sat. There's three orders ready to be delivered. 
Uh, and you got someone asking where the bathroom is and all they're looking for is critical thinking. There's no right answer. They just want to build a little bit of a puzzle and make sure you're sharp on your feet. You know, well, the first thing I would do is communicate with my team and let them know we divide and conquer. I obviously want to deal with that upset customer, probably go grab a manager in this case, make sure they're not waiting long because we screwed that up. Make sure to tell the two customers they're going to be sat and they're a priority. I go help deliver some of the food right after I talk to the, the hostess and make sure that, you know, all it is is working through the problem and saying, you know, I can deal with adversity. Uh, I, it's okay. I'm okay under that stress. And the people that could do that, I think they have a little bit of ADHD because they can multitask. And as long as you give them the tools and help them focus, it's a superpower. And most business owners, I'm in I'm in rooms all the time. I've keynoted a countless amount. I say, how many people think they have a touch of ADHD and every hand goes up? So I think it's important to be able to multitask. You know, in Elevate, you do a great job kind of really going through attracting and retaining and developing a players. Talk a little bit about the the hiring process. Yeah, so first of all, I used to think marketing was a function only to get great clients, understand the avatar, get more of them. And right now we get on average 26,000 calls a month and book 20,000 new clients per month. Um, everybody says they want to get in the garage door business. And I'm like, there's no number two. There's a reason, uh, you know, but we're systems are running the business today. But um, I figured out that indeed Glassdoor, ZipRecruiter, Monster, LinkedIn, Craigslist are a place where people go when they're unemployed. Some people are looking for something better. But where does my avatar hang out? You know, a future technician or CSR, usually they're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. They might be on Snapchat or, or, or X, you know, Twitter. So I started to change my way of marketing and start looking for great people who like to win, that want more for their lives, that dream bigger, that just, they're great people. They've already got a job, but but I think they do better with us. And there's also this other part of it that when I see somebody great, I recruit them and I'm pretty good at it because I'm uh, I'm very adamant. I, I mean, literally, I'm tenacious. I, 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 I w I'm relentless. And um, give me a, give me an example, because I know you do a lot of follow up. And people are surprised by it. Yeah. So one day I was driving my discount tire. I saw a dude just, just handling three cars at once. And I know discount tire, they know how to fix stuff. They know how to sell. Uh, they got good training. And I just, I drove up to the guy and I said, dude, you're one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. Are you happy here? And he goes, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I go, I, I see you as a future leader in the garage door industry. And by the way, I see a clear clear opportunity for you to make six figures. I started asking him a few questions. I took a selfie with him and I said, just do me this favor. I said, I'll pay you for the day. I'll take you to lunch. I'll just live the life of a technician for one day. And he didn't get back to me. So I sent him a question mark the next day. The next day I sent him a video of one of our top technicians about how his life changed by switching to this career. It's more flexible. He's got a better relationship with his kids and his wife. He's taking care of himself more. Uh, he takes PTO. Finally, he bought a house. And if you're just, if you keep going, it's only a matter of time before they have a bad day and they'll come check it out. But you got to follow through. You got to roll out the red carpet when they come and do a champagne toast and not just give them a manual and say, follow my top guy for two weeks, then you're on your own forever. You got to have culture and you got to have, and it's a lot easier said than done. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a work in progress. I'd love to tell you everything's perfect here, but it's not. And it never is. It's not perfect at Amazon or, or or any of the other massive, massive companies, even the ones that are super giving back to the communities. So, I mean, there's always some that feels left out and that there's imposters in the leadership program. But an A player will run circles around five B players. It used to be three I used to think 1A equals 3B. Now I think 1A equals 5B players. And there, I'm not saying a B player can't be developed. But, man, when you recognize an A player, and, and I love people that are competitive, that love to win, 
but they hate to lose more and they want more for their family. They dream bigger. They're willing to make a little bit of sacrifice. They got the discipline. And when I recognize that trait and it's few and far between, because some people go on this honeymoon, well, we know all know what that means, but um, we've got a trial period for 30 days. You're 30 days in your market. You got to show up sober. You got to ask great questions. You got to get along with people. You got to smile. You got to make eye contact. You got to tell a good story. You got to not be on your social media and smoking cigarettes, chain smoking. If you do all those things, usually you're pretty good. You can fake it for a week. It's hard to fake it for a month. Then you got another trial period where we send you to Phoenix into the training program for a month. And these guys know how to recognize winners because we track them for the first 90 days. We track them forever, but they start to recognize. We see these high correlations with certain attributes. So you've heard the phrase, hire a slow, fire fast. Well, you got to open up that funnel. And if that funnel's big enough, and you never know. We've been wrong before. We, we've seen guys take apart guns, come from the military, move up fast in the military. They want to come here. And they didn't work out like some of the people you think because we see some of the best athletes with six packs that are super responsible that take care of themselves sometimes aren't the best. Like, you know, through trial and error and uh, I, I haven't found the magic pill yet. Like this is where you find them. I was going to ask, you know, with those cases, you know, you do kind of a postmortem. Was there anything you found of like, this person seemed perfect on paper? They seemed perfect in the interview process. And you don't have to name names, but like, what's one example? Like, okay, this we just didn't see. And now we did something in the hiring process because of that. What was one of those that surprised you? And what what it, was it in the postmortem? Well, a, sometimes A-plus players for a smaller company, they're unicorns but they're also not humble. They're also not team players. It's more of a culture. Situation. Yeah, so there's got to be this core value, mission, vision, all these things that you they could do great. They could change a company. They could be great at sales, conversion rates, but they're so cocky and they're disrespectful and they roll their eyes. So I'd rather have a team player that's out there getting five-star reviews, taking care of my clients than like building the lifetime value there's someone that's like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I got that person for everything they got. Like somebody that's going to help grandma pull the Christmas tree down or, or fill up a tire when they don't really need to. Or talk to the kids and wonder about how their school day was and when they don't have to, when they're having a bad day. Because we all zip it up sometimes. We, we build this ultra ego. Everyone has one. You know, Kobe Bryant was a black mamba. And understanding that our job is to serve when we're working. And you're not thinking about work. When you're at home and you're not thinking about home when you're at work, you got to do your job and you get paid great for it and you should enjoy it. And if you don't, I'll pay you to leave and I'll write you a testimonial and get, you know, I'll get you a good job because maybe you're not a great fit for our company. If you do not want to win at life and you don't want more, but you might be a great person and you might fit in perfectly somewhere, I will pay you to leave and I'll help you get a job. And I've done this with three people in the last month. So the hiring process, and then they are onboarded and there's a training process. And obviously there's, you have the headquarters in Phoenix. What are some of the things that are essential when people land in the headquarters for training? Well, I like them to really start to identify their smart goals, dreams, and what they want out of life. And nobody really thinks about dreaming anymore. You know, you're 30 years old. You, you wanted to be a, a firefighter. But really, what do you want? Not only materialistic, but who do you want to grow closer to? What's important to you? How does your credit score? Like, think about these things. Think about, are you happy when you look in the mirror? Do you have energy all day? Do you feel like you're a good dad or a good mom? And I dare them to dream a little bit bigger. That's important. Um making sure that they are excited to be there, that they chose the right career and they got in where most people didn't. And we're going to change the world. It's, it's a garage door company, but it's so much more. We just delivered 101 pallets of water to the Justice Center, which gives it to the homeless and a 20-foot a trailer full of food. And we're just getting started. I had the CEO of uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation, uh, Wounded Warriors were getting involved in. But regardless of that, you know, 
they've got to understand the true intentions of what we're trying to do with our clients and also the coworkers and how we win together. And just because you're winning doesn't mean they're losing. And we could serve clients in a bigger way just because it's not a big ticket or, or because you didn't like maybe they're moving to another house in a year. Maybe they're the HOA president. We didn't know it. Maybe their wife's the number one realtor in all of Arizona. Uh, and don't do that just because you think there's something, but do that because imagine there's a video camera on you all the time. And maybe it's grandma looking down. Maybe it's Jesus, but maybe it's just the news and, and how or maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your kids. But but make them proud. You know, go above and beyond. Do the right thing. Do what you would do for your own mother, especially if you grew up and you love your mom. Or if not, do grandma or your uncle or whoever it was, your Aunt Sally. What's the, when they um, are hired to when they're out in the field by themselves, like how long is the training process and kind of what does the timeline look like typically? Yeah, so you're training for two months. And then you're you're getting a lot more training. Uh, we call it polishing for another month. And then there's still meetings every day that you're training. We got a mojo call. We've got a one hour meeting Thursdays. And we're getting What's the ready. mojo call. Talk about that. Yeah. So 15 minutes, we talk about the big wins from yesterday. Any updates? So, hey, guys, welcome back to the mojo call. Let's talk about some big wins. We go over the numbers from the day. We go over the great reviews. We talk about the big wins. And I'm prepped to call on one person in that market to say something, something happened. You, you had a mental breakthrough. It's always positive news. It's never, we got to do better. You guys suck. You're not, cut, they we're not setting the record, whatever it is. It's never pessimistic. So we're going to talk about what's the big win and, and what happened when, how did you do that? Uh, how did you sell a service agreement at every job? How did you get not only one five-star review, but you got three from every client? Because um, success leaves clues and we like to share those. So we got this environment of sharing. And when they hear it from their brothers and sisters, it's real. They can hear it from me and the other leaders all day. And I, sometimes I say, how was your paycheck this week? Because I saw you set a record. What is that going to do for you and your family? So Mojo call, keep going. You said there's other other calls. So Thursdays we train um, for an hour where everybody comes in across the country. We do um, ride-alongs. We've got a market acceleration technician training team that flies to markets. We've got uh, virtual product specialists. We've got 16 of them that handle calls when, you've, when you're going to sell a door, if the client's interested in a new door rather than fixing their old beat-up door. We got one of those calls on Wednesdays. Uh, I interview two technicians a week that are killing it. That goes out to every market. It's a 20-minute call at the end of their one-hour training. Uh, Luke does a podcast internally with two top guys, and that comes out each week. Uh, and then we're actually adding, if you're not hitting a threshold, and by the way, the threshold is built on your dreams, not our goals. So if you're not hitting your expectations of yourself and dreaming bigger, we're not going to reprimand you. We're just going to remind you of why you're doing this. The, the things that you picked, and we peel back that onion, and we're going to force it. And, and you're going to be forced to train more. And people might say, well, that's the, they don't want to train. Well, listen, they're accountable to their own goals and their own dreams. Or maybe we didn't unpack that enough to figure out what's going to make them go more. Or maybe they got to pick up an extra shift, a night shift. Maybe they got to, whatever it is, if they got to take dad camping and he's on his last leg and they want to have one last fishing trip, we're going to bring that up and we're going to show him or her how to get there. And there's a lot more going on. But the idea is training is not something you do. It's something that's always done. It's not like, hey, we're going to train this week. It's like it's it's a culture of always improving. In fact, I don't know if you can read that, but I'm wearing the bracelet. One of our core values, always improving. You know, we were, before we hit record, we were talking about health and it reminds me of that. It's like, you're in shape. You can't just like, okay, I'm in shape now. I'm going to stop working out, stop eating right. It's a continual process to stay in shape. Yeah, do realtors stop learning about real estate? Do doctors stop learning about <laughs> new medicine? I mean, every other profession, 
Well, I used to do two a days in football, right? We practice 10 times a week to play one game. But in home service or some businesses, we say, hey, you made it through training, you're done forever. And we expect people to be great. I mean, and a lot of it is just understanding EQ, right? Like think through their eyes, talk to them like they're your mom, you know, watch your mannerisms, say thank you. Make sure your breath smells good when you pull. We don't teach sales. We teach how to be a better human. Talk about a key hire, obviously, starting from scratch, growing this company. What is uh, maybe a key hire or two throughout your journey that you remember was, was pivotal for you? The first one was my mom. <laughs> 2010, I got her to move. Uh, one of the reasons was, is I realized really quickly I couldn't trust people. And that was partly because I couldn't pay a lot and I didn't know how to hire. I didn't understand how to interview. Um, so I needed somebody I could trust. And my mom and stepdad filled in the blank. They did the stuff I didn't want to do. And my mom was so nice and empathetic on the phones. Uh, a few years later, we hired a guy named Adam Cronenberg. He was like a general manager at the time. I didn't even know what I was going to pay him. I'd give him a check whenever I could. Uh, I just told him, what's your number at the end of this? And he said, if you could give me five million, I'll come murder it for you. And I'll step in where, where you don't want to. And he did everything he said he was going to do. And I did everything. I, I gave him three. He earned. I didn't give him anything. I, he, he ended up getting three times that. Um, but he was an integrator. I didn't know it at the time until I read Rocket Fuel by Mark Winters and Gina Wickman. But I didn't realize Roy Williams ran. Walt Disney's dream. And a lot of people think they're both, but the visionary needs to maintain the vision. The integrator figures out how to get to that vision and they work together. And there's not a lot of visionaries. A lot of people want stuff, but they don't even have an idea on how to get there, what it looks like and, and what the company should be and what the core values of mission vision and how it's going to grow. And I, I'm a marketing guy. I'm a culture guy. I love sales. But I don't like a lot of operations. I'm not a good finance guy. I, I've had to learn those things and be a little bit rounded about it. But uh, I don't ever go to work. I'm here at work right now. But if this is work, I love what I do. I, that's why it's like, man, when, when, is, when are you going to be done? I don't think I'll ever be done because I built the dream life. So for you, I mean, your mom, but also a big one was an integrator that could basically do everything, you know, be operations and take help execute the vision. 100%. Yep. I know a big part of your journey um, is mentors. Yeah. Um, and you talk a lot about the mentors in your book. And, uh, you know, again, I... Um, full disclosure, I was listening in two and a half times speed, but I think you said Al Levy was one of the big mentors. Is I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Al Levy, I think, was episode two or three of my podcast that I started in 2017. And he lived in Scottsdale. So he said, Well, I don't mean you do lunch. I want to learn more about your business. I've seen you around town. So we went to lunch and he wrote the book, The Seven Power Contractor, like I said. And and he uh he said, can I go back to your shop and learn more about your business? I said, I love that. The, the one thing he was really surprised is how well I listened and how I took notes. And he said, hey, and he criticized my business pretty hard. He really made me feel bad. But he offered a solution. And I don't think he was just trying to sell me because I, now I know I'll leave you very, very well. He's like a second dad. And uh, he said, if I work with you, your business is going to become way too easy. And you're going to probably grow very, very fast because right now you're the biggest firefighter I've ever. You're so good. at You handle all the bad reviews. You handle the payroll discrepancy. Like you're so good. He goes, but you need manual standard operating procedures, systems and checklists. You need a really good org chart. You need a depth chart. When you need to understand the steps of delegation and the triangle of communication. And so we hired him and it wasn't cheap. And uh, he said, Tommy, you're so good at generating revenue. We're going to help you figure out how to build profit. And he hired a couple of people underneath him to teach me other stuff that he was not the best at, but he knew who to bring in. And he used to always tell me, like, 
he told me this twice. I, I might have to fire you as a client because you're too busy listening to every book and every idea. If it's not EOS, it's this, it's this, it's this. Like, just listen to what I tell you and stop learning until you get these fundamentals down because you, you're looking for the answers in every direction. And I got the answers. I'm, I'm tried and I'm true and I'm trying to help you. So I had to kind of stop with the ideas. I still made a list. He taught me how to make my top 100, top 30, top five. And you, you cannot kill my dreams. You can't just say you're, you're not going to be able to do anything or think anymore. But he said, we've got a list for this. And it was a Trello board back then. And uh, he used to tell me, just stop and listen. And we're going to get this done right now. We're going to get to the finish line on this manual. Then we're going to do this manual. You're going to read them out loud. And then you're going to make sure you've got a, a data integrity team to make sure the reporting's correct. And, and he was right. I met him at 17 million. I bounced to 40 in no time. And then he said, I think you need to rebrand because your raps suck. And there's nothing kind of, it, 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 your yard signs don't look like your Valpac coupons, don't look like your signature on your email. And so he said, go to Dan Antonelli with kick charge. And Dan gave me a price and it was more than I wanted to spend, but I trusted Al Levy. I did it. Man, we shot up to 80 million. And people wanted to work here when the brand was right. I didn't understand how important this brand was. And I'm like, I still go to Al for Al. And he centers me. I took Al's stuff and took it to more technology. We got out of Dropbox and off of Word Docs. But, but Al, is, uh, he's 71, and he's, he's the best mentor I've ever had. And I, I recommend Seven Power Contractor. Uh, he's got the program I paid him several hundred grand for, for like, I don't know, eight or 10,000 or something, but changed my life. And and a lot of people will never have a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with him. He still does phone calls, like 30-minute sessions. But if you could implement the things that he considers to be vanilla and they're not fun and building systems and building scorecards and making sure that the people are winning, um, it'll rocket their business into a new orbit. Talk about the scorecards for a second. Yeah, so a scorecard, like when I was a kid, we had a report card that tell, told when I was absent, when I was late or tardy. It, it told what I was doing in each aspect, social studies and, and English and math. Um, so we decided, just like Jack Welch, people should know where they stand. They should know who's winning. They should know who to ask if they want to get better at who's getting the most reviews, the most five-star reviews, who's getting the best conversion rate, who's getting the best, highest average ticket, and how are they doing it? Um, you know, and there's a lot more to it, but these are really, really, really accurate numbers. That's the problem with most scorecards is the data is not right. And the minute you're wrong on the data and somebody figures it out, they don't trust you and they think you're lying and cheating from them. So it's not easy, but you could just take like what's in it for them? How can they win? So if you're paying somebody $15 an hour and they're booking 65% of the calls and you take the historical data and you say, what happens if they get to 85%? What does that mean to the company? It's just a little bit of math. You do it on an Excel. You could do it on a calculator, on a phone calculator. And you could almost play with the numbers to say, I could actually pay them $9 a phone call. And they can make an extra, you know, go from 15 to 22. But the company makes an extra $2,000. So we'd be happy to pay them 22. And they can make it to $29 an hour. And now you got A players retention you're changing their lives i'm not saying 29 dollars is changing people's lives but i don't like to put a, a limit on it i like to say listen if you recruit somebody you can get 1500 dollars unlimited hey if you sell a service agreement on the phone you can make money on that hey if you really want to grow into this position just tell us we have another position that you move up there's starter roles you know i i don't think somebody somebody that's listening might say oh how is somebody supposed to live at 22 dollars an hour well how is somebody supposed to live, make a minimum wage at a shopping center, bagging groceries? They move up into different positions. But I like people to be able to make a lot of money. And I, I love paying a lot. Because when they're getting paid, I know we're winning too.
and we can celebrate, not have animosity that this person's making too much money. I love performance pay. Talk about the, you've professionalized over the years and probably Al helped you do that. And you talk a lot in the book about Service Titan. Um, what are some of the software and tools you use as a business that have helped uh, your growth? Oh, man. So Chirp is this automation tool that Ryan Fenn presented at one of my conferences and I went to my CTO, Jim Leslie, and I said, could this work for us? So we talked to their developers and they needed to develop, they needed to Ford develop the product for the company size we were and the API pulls we needed. And man, I whiteboarded for days and I figured out ways to build automations for if you didn't sell a customer, if you didn't book a phone call, if you had a cancellation or you had a service agreement or you needed to get the extended warranty processed. And man, we started adding several hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit a month because of the technology. Service Titan's amazing. Intact's amazing. You look at Rilla Voice is an AI tool that allows us to hear the conversations when you're at a house. You only need one person consent, so it's easy to make sure they're following the script and to make sure they treated our customers with respect. You've got Rapid Hire is who Jody Utterhill I use them to recruit for me. I've got 50 new guys that started about 13 days ago, just this month. And next month, our class is over 40. And they have these job fairs that we invite everybody to. We feed them and, and they market on social media for us. And they're a big piece of how we hire. I, I've had so, uh, we use Power BI uh, to actually statistical analysis to tell us the data. And it tells us the right moves in marketing. And we can pull in significant data. We use this thing called Dispatch Pro under Service Titan that takes statistical evidence based on, um, it's based on, it's not AI, but it's machine learning to tell us who's the best person to go to this job based on previous experience. And we're a technology company that does garage doors. I mean, if I was to be real, uh, I, I depend a lot on technology for, for the way I make decisions. I'm curious. Um, you eventually um, went the private equity route, right? Yeah. Um, talk about that process and what made you decide to um, go that route. So, I pretty much know all the big hitters that got on the service tight. It's the who's who's. It's the, the biggest empire. There, there's not a massive company in home service, especially in HVAC, plumbing, electrical, garage, uh, now roofing, gutters, paint, that are not on service tight. So I got introduced to all these guys, and I spent a lot of time with them. And I started learning about private equity. And I had a board, uh, a board of advisors each month we meet up and uh, – Tom Howard, one of my buddies, said, never sell this company. Like, it's a cash cow. And all of a sudden, that darn virus happened, COVID, and it just skyrocketed the business. I mean, we, if you, we were hiring, training. We had more leads than we knew what to do with. And the multiples. So it's like you take your profit and there's multiples went higher and higher because movie theaters were closing down. Uh, hotels, supermarkets, nail salons. We were like deemed essential. And the writing was on the wall and Tom flew out and said, dude, he goes, how many opportunities do you have right now to buy companies? I said, endless. He goes, how, how could you buy them? I said, well, we got 12 million in the bank. I got a delay draw term loan for 25 million, but it's a seasoning period of three months. And we started doing math on the whiteboard. We watched the big short. I was at the apartments and uh, like the deal was, is I had given 25 people a form of equity called an equity incentive program. And, you know, if I never sold, they would never get the big event. And uh, we would decide to do a formal process. We had the team in place to do it. We had kind of all of our T's crossed and I's dotted. And uh, the business got valued, you know, right under 600 million. 
um, and a deal got struck and I still retained just under half of the business. And we decided we were much stronger with the company we were with because they had Ken Goodrich with ghetto called me and said, dude, you're about to get an education. Like you've never seen, you're going to understand financial engineering and how to use debt and exactly what needs to happen to raise capital. And what these guys understand at Wall Street and with combined with your knowledge of the home service space, when you learn that side of it, how money works and trades hands, he goes, you're going to be freaking deadly. And I've been a sponge, man. I've been learning so much. This, The team we're with is called Cork Tech. And these guys are so freaking smart and they're so available for me. I don't think they've ever dealt with somebody that like calls them more than they call us, that I'm overly communicating and I said, give me your biggest, best company you've ever worked with. I'm going to make them look like a tiny little ant. And I set big goals and they go, dude, that's not possible. And I go, we'll see. And they invited me to speak. The only founder they invited to speak in New York um, in front of all their investors. And um, I say I have zero regrets. Zero regrets because we're going to have another deal in the next two years. A hundred other millionaires are going to come out of it. and. Uh, I've learned how this works and it doesn't seem legal because there's so much money to be made. Um, but also how many lives are we changing? Uh, you know, how many homeowners come out of this? How many people have set up 401ks? How many people now have insurance and they're driving new trucks and they're showing up to church and showing up to dinner with their families. There's all kinds of great things that came out of this that I, I there was unintended things that ended up being great that I didn't even think about. Goals wise, is that are you folk one of your focuses on purchasing other companies right now? Yeah, so there, there's a few ways to grow. You can grow organically, expand your market. You could go greenfield, which open up new market from scratch. You could buy. It's called mergers and acquisitions, typically acquisitions under the platform company, or you could add services, which is another way of growing organically. And we're doing all those things. Um, it's hard to be good at all of them. The easy way is just to buy companies, but that way is a lot harder than people think because you're taking a different culture and you're trying to blend them. And we've learned a lot of lessons, man. It's it's a uh, it's been a fun experience to learn. We've done a, you know we make mistakes all the time, but we remember and then we build a, a you know some type of checklist or SOP around it, and um, it gets easier and easier. And you start to really identify not everybody is a good acquisition. Like there's a lot of people that are not disciplined. Uh, they used to be if you bought five companies in one trade, made them report through a CRM in the same financial, it could be you know QuickBooks or Intact, that you could sell that as one. Now, these companies, these private equity or investment committees, they're getting really, really smart and they're doing better diligence. And they're realizing that it's got to be one culture. It's got to be tied together. And typically, you want that platform to stay founder-based. Uh, but they'll still buy companies, but they won't get the multiple. I'm curious, Tommy, when you're looking to buy these companies, is it specific? Because um, you mentioned, obviously, other services uh, as well. Is it specific? Okay, we're looking to acquire other garage door companies or maybe other companies that are serve, you know, like pest control, obviously, we Austin Clark is awesome, mutual friend, um, and other types of businesses. Are you focused on the same niche or adding services? So when my, my particular case, we've really, we've taken the number one spot in garage doors. We, we know how to do retrofit residential garage doors. So that's where we've mastered. I, I, I Not with this investment that I, with the partners I have now, I could guarantee you in the future, we're going to say, what else can we serve the clients we serve in another industry and get, get a master of that and blend us? But right now, there's so much space to expand. You know, it, we share a lot, too, with other garage store companies because we need to make the industry come up. We need to change the mind of, you know, they, they, they the old way of thinking is just you're taking advantage, you're charging too much, or you're just... You hire salespeople, but you know, the way I look at it is you watch these guys that make $40,000 a year. They work 12 hour days, five days a week. They drive an old beat up trucks. The garage door breaks every one year. 
They're not offering anything above and beyond like my Q for their garage door, a video keypad or a bottom rubber to keep the bugs out. They don't even mention it, even though it's shock. They go in there and fix. It's like saying, hey, you got a ball tire that just went flat. I'm going to fix that one tire. And every time your next tire comes back, I'll just fix them one at a time. Oh, and I won't even look at your brakes. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So the old baby boomer mentality of we're just going to get by. We're not going to give options. We're going to give ultimatums. You either say yes or no. We're not going to create a relationship. We're not going to make sure you got a great experience. We're not going to go above and beyond. That's not who we are. I'm not saying we're the, the only way of doing things. But if you're not giving options, you're giving ultimatums. And it's not right for me to pick the solution for the client. It's okay to let them pick what's going to be right for them and their family. Throughout the years, Tommy, you've um, you know rolled up your sleeves a lot, and specifically with mad customers. And I love some of your stories around what you've done in the extreme cases with some mad customers. What are some of your favorite stories of of what you've done? Well, I built a team that handles this, but they always give the calls so throughout the years. They give me the hardest one. They say this person needs to talk to the owner. And there's so many stories. I mean, I brought a lady flowers and I fixed it myself and I apologized profusely. And that ended up, I didn't plan on it, but it made it into the newspaper because she couldn't believe that I would do that. And we brought people cider and and, and donuts uh, just because we knew that their kids loved it and to make up. Um, I've written checks back for the whole service because I was embarrassed that the manufacturer, we made a mistake. Uh but I love it when an impossible customer calls up and all I do is say, I've heard that we really dropped the ball. Can you tell me everything so I could take notes and make sure this never happens again? I'm embarrassed. When I started this company, it was me running every call. I got my mom and stepdad to move here from Michigan and I can't believe we let this happen and I will make sure this never happens again. Tell me everything. And sometimes these calls are 40 minutes that I don't get a word in, but they just want to feel heard. They want to know that someone's taking notes and actually going to create a system. Shit happens. We know that. And I can't help it if a guy broke down and got a flat tire. I can't help it if the manufacturer didn't get the parts in in time. I can't help it if a CSR got the wrong address. And there's a million things that could go wrong. Uh, you know, or a guy smells really bad because he's in 140 degrees for eight hours and he was soaking at the last job. I mean, that's embarrassing. Uh, but, but, you know, people want to feel heard. And I, I think I do a pretty good job of that. That's uh golden time. I appreciate you sharing that. I have one last question. Um, before I ask it, I want to point people to check out uh, homeserviceexpert.com. Uh, Tommy, they have a great podcast there. Great Yes, uh, also freedomevent.com uh, for the next upcoming event. And then obviously a1garage.com. Maybe they're in your area. It's funny because I was at my in-laws in Scottsdale and uh, both A1 Garage is their vendor and also Austin Clark's Pest Control uh, is their vendor. So Box, yeah. yeah. Um, last question is shop tours. All right. I'd love to hear about how the shop tours work and, and why you even decided to do shop tours. So I learned a hack and it's the number one hack in on the planet. Get yourself out of your comfort zone and go visit a company you want to become. And success leaves clues. And when you hear about the culture and people love to work at this company and they're extra profitable, and their clients are raving fans with well, the air is different. Like the, the the hustle is different inside of that building. Like the systems are amazing. So everybody opened their door to me. It's like they said, you're a garage store guy. You're a kid. Come on in. And they couldn't believe it. I'd show up with pizza. I'd show up. I'd get, have their books for them to sign. I'd have it all highlighted. I'd literally take notes. And I was very respectful, but here's what they appreciated the most is I listened and I implemented. And so my thought was, people ask, hey, could I come do this? Can I see this? And if I could give people, it's not necessarily about seeing our success, but it's about hearing our failures. 
Because if I could help somebody avoid what I went through, then they're winning. And because so many people opened their doors and mentored me and people are afraid to ask. So all I'd say is get out of your comfort zone. It doesn't need to be, if you're in Phoenix, come, but if you're out of Phoenix, get out of your comfort zone, get away from the, the, the noise and come in with some good questions and I'll answer everything and you'll meet my team. And uh, it's my way of giving back. It's a way because we keep the place clean. It's a way to, for me to brag on my team. It's a way for me that if you call me a year later, which just happens a lot and says, I'm a better father, I'm a better leader, I'm a better husband. And you had a part of changing my life. There's nothing that comes close to that. I don't care about all the money in the world or whatever's going on when someone says that. Everything changes. Like the, the, the way I feel, it's just, it's like amazing. Tommy, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone, check out homeserviceexpert.com and the other websites and podcasts. Tommy, thanks so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Great job. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.